I'm surprised to see so many faces early in the morning in Las Vegas. I'm surprised I'm here. Uh, my name is Joel Eagle. I work for uh, McDonald's Corporation. Uh, today we're going to talk a little bit around uh, some of the technology we use to make a modern experience both for our, our customers as well as our, uh, from an IT perspective, internal customers. That, that would be our uh, staff. I'm going to go through a little bit around uh, some factoids about McDonald's. We'll talk a little bit around what you think you might know about McDonald's. I'm not here to tell you if the chicken nuggets are real. Yes, they are. <laughs> I'm not here to talk about whether we have pink slime. No, we don't. You want to talk more about that and debate it? That's fine. We can do that after the, after the show. But uh, how many people, show of hands, have seen the movie The Founder? Awesome. Now, you'll know some things around how McDonald's came about around The Founder. There are some things that corporate probably doesn't agree with, whatever. I personally think Michael Keaton got an Oscar snub, but uh, it was a great movie. But a lot of cool things came out around how we operate and what kind of business we're in. So with that, some factoids. Now, this information is a little bit old, but it's very public. Um, in terms of our revenue, things like that. In fact, it's around 2014, uh, 15 uh, data that we show up here. So one of the things that came out in the, at the end of the movie, The Founder, which I think is fairly impressive, and I don't really, uh, I don't know that it matters so much whether you think uh, where your ethics are around uh, McDonald's or the fast food industry or QSR in general, right? But we, we at McDonald's uh, feed around 70 million people every day every 24 hours, not a month, not a whatever, it's every 24 hours, 70 million people a day. And what I, the reason I mention that is you need to think about the logistics and what it requires to support that kind of operation. Put a product in your body, right? Food, not, not a click and ship, right? But food uh, prepared, shipped around the world. We operate in about 120 countries now. Uh, you'll see 35,000 plus restaurants. And I'll get into what, what, a, what the way you should think about a restaurant, especially from IT folks as well, is what you should think about when you think about a McDonald's restaurant, what that, what that really is. The way we like to look at it is uh, we have quick service uh, restaurants is the industry we're in, but the way you need to think about a restaurant is it's a factory. So you go in as a customer in the front side and you see menu items and things to order and then something happens, you, you, you order something uh, or the drive-through, whatever you do, uh, things churn the background and out comes it out, uh, and our output to you. Right? So if you think about this as just-in-time manufacturing, you have raw goods coming in the back door. Um, we have uh, a number of processes in place. You order something as a customer SKU, maybe you call it a number two uh, or whatever, and that means a whole bunch of SKUs go in action. There are servers inside these little factories. These servers parse out menu items throughout the restaurant. They, they only send the information to the right station at the right place, the right time to put an order together. All this comes back together at a collection point. Either we give it to you as a, as a drive-through or we give it to you across the counter. Lots of things happen. We'd like to do all that inside of 90 seconds. We don't always do it, but let's be honest. The slowest thing in a McDonald's restaurant is you. Making up your mind, changing your order, trying to pay with cash, <laughs> right? You're the slowest thing we have in the operation, right? But you are the customer. There's an old saying, the customer is always right. I prefer the older saying that says, the customer is not always right, but they are the ones with the money. So part of what we'll do today and talk about some of that, some of this technology and, and Cetera specifically is talk about how we think about that uh, within McDonald's and how we think about delivering solutions to both our internal staff as well as to customers such as you. Uh, with that, uh, a couple of things some of you probably know about. Uh, in the U.S., we went to all-day breakfast last year. Um, my favorite thing that happened, I think, uh, is all-day breakfast. For those of you who don't know, I think we were around 6% bump in comps when that happened. We thought maybe we would cannibalize people that just you know, got lazy, wanted to come later, eat breakfast. Turns out we got 6% bump in that. Do you see the little uh, the guy with the with the riding uh, moped? And throughout Asia, we've been doing e-commerce uh, and digital, if you will, in Asia for quite some time. There's about a billion dollars worth of business we do uh, just doing delivery uh, in many places throughout Asia. Um, that's been running for quite a while. And you'll notice uh, there are different products around the world for different markets that we have, which create. Um, I'm using the Maharaja Mac uh, as an example. Fabulous. If you ever go to the Indian places where they serve that, it's a fantastic sandwich. Um, that'll make other people in PETA happy. But anyway, so we have different, different products that we offer around the world, which create challenges around how to deliver that. Um, <clears throat> we also started thinking differently around how we, do, how we can provide services to our customers around the world, which for us would be 
uh, McDonald's uh, staff, right, if you think about that. I saw something on the earlier slide, I think I mentioned, if you think about the McDonald's system, we're talking about uh, close to two million people. When you think about who all is in that system, uh, from a corporate perspective, we don't employ that many directly, but that's about how many operate in the system. Um, and we thought about ways to provide things like uh, service tests to them or in incident problems to them or how to, how to help them collaborate, how to help them get to data. I mean, as you can imagine, 120 countries, we travel a lot, we go around the world a lot, we need access to data, we need work networks that work when you show up in an office, uh, restaurants need to work, et cetera. And what I've listed up here is some examples of things that we did and said when we put out uh, support for our customers, if you will, the people who are supporting you, providing things for you, in what ways do we want to engage them? So part of it is we can't have things that don't scale. I mean, one, two million people, 120 countries, 35,000 restaurants, scale is always something we're thinking about. There's another phrase at McDonald's, a sort of internal phrase that we have, uh, I'll share with you is, and I, they, they, they kind of drummed this into my head when I first uh, started with McDonald's uh, some years ago. It's not real until it's in the restaurant. I don't know how many people work in the back office, but how does it make you feel? <laughs> if you're doing financials or you're doing help desk, right, it's not real unless it's, it's in the restaurant. So we think about how to be relevant to restaurants with solutions and we think about scale on that. And we think, you know, if we're going to do things like enable you to communicate with us, why am I providing you bespoke ways of doing it that don't scale and require high touch points? Why not just let you chat with me in whatever version of chat you have in whatever country you're in and let you, let you inter interface with me that way? Why don't I use mobile apps, right? How many of you took training on how to use your airline app to get here today? then why in the heck would I ask a customer of mine to take training on how to use an app? And I'm talking about help desk people, right? I'm talking about IT staff. Why would I ask them to learn to take training on how to do something better if, I don't, if, if the world doesn't ask you and you do it just fine? I didn't get trained on my banking app either, but I bought an airline ticket and I got here, right? So that's the thinking that we want to change around, around the way we deliver solutions. Yes, they need to work, they need to be reliable, but they need to be simple. And we'll get into some of that. Some of the things you need to think about as well is, and I've seen this theme happen in a couple of other sessions here at Gartner, is understand your business. Do you know what business you're in? Show of hands the people that, that think they know the business McDonald's is in. Do you know what business we're in? Come on, you, some of you saw the movie, <laughs> right? Shout out something, anything. Real estate. So if you ask Ray Kroc, and he's been asked many times, what business you're in, he had two answers depending on who he was talking to, I think. One, real estate. The other, show business. <coughs> show business, it's about the experience, right? Um, how many of, you, many of you might remember birthday parties, going to McDonald's, birthday parties? Some of you might remember just what it was to tell your mom, I don't want the homemade greasy burger thing that you do, I want the McDonald's cheeseburger. I'll tell you, in some places in the world, if you Google, um, you can do it now if you like, but if you Google up McDonald's weddings and add something like Singapore instead of Walmart, um, you will see grandiose planned wedding events at McDonald's locations throughout the world. And I'm not talking about you know, goofy things, I'm talking about full-on wedding planned events that happen around the world. It's a different way of thinking about what McDonald's means in different brands. So the question you have to ask yourself is, do you understand the business you're in? Do you understand what's relevant to them? I gave you the example of, is it real until it's in the restaurant? When you think about d delivering solutions, are you thinking that way? when you pick your technology part partners to drive those solutions for you. This is the things that we were thinking about, I'll get into in a little bit around why we worked with CTERRA, what, 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 why they were a fit for McDonald's, what we were trying to accomplish. The other thing is, uh, we talk about agile size of your organization, this doesn't mean right size, this doesn't mean layoff people, it doesn't mean doing that, it means get the right partners, uh, get, have the right skill sets to do things, and get a mindset of, let's try something, right? Not doing something is the worst thing you can do. We talk about uh, progress over perfection, that's our current CEOs, Mantra, which means you need to accomplish something. Think of things in 1.0, 2.0, 3.0 iterations, uh, tying back into the agile thinking. Um, do you understand if you're successful or not? What does successful mean? So if I were to say to you, we wrote an application specific uh, on, on uh, mobile devices for uh, our end users to do things like contact the help desk. How do I know if my application is good? Is it adoption? Is it absorption? Is it customer satisfaction? A lot of things to think about, but do you understand? If you don't understand those things, it's going to make it difficult for you to understand what success really is unless you've got it, an easy one, right? Go save a million dollars. Well, that's an easy thing if you save the money or not. But were you successful at doing it? Were you sustainable at doing it? Think of ways to measure healthy, not just success in terms of uh, an ROI, if, if, if that means anything. Innovate and modernize. Uh, that the, the point there is, and consumerize things, 
We're McDonald's, and I personally, excuse me, Joel, do not know the right way to tickle somebody's brain to make them do something. All the marketing people in the room study this. It's a, it's a, I don't know how to do that, right? But I do, I can watch and learn what works in the marketplace. So I gave you the example of who's been, who's been trained on their banking app. So when, when we wrote our app, here was the, here was the requirements. I said to them, you have eight weeks. We will agile this, we'll iterate every Friday. You will come in on Friday, we will have a stand-up meeting, we won't even sit down, we'll iterate around some decisions, we'll decide what you need to go. Requirement number one, there will be no training. No one will be trained on how to use the app. If your app requires training, fail. Uh, number two, you do not get to sit down and ask a bunch of people what their requirements are. What you can do is we gave them 10 roles from admin to executive and said, here are 10 roles in our company, you can have two hours to talk to them. Two hours in a room, ask them whatever you want, and that's it, go off and write an app. Right? Go do what you need to do. Um, I would argue with you that that made the app focus on simple things. You create things like a button that says, help desk call me back. A button that says, reset my password. Simple things, right? But these are, these are things that help people get through the day and, and be successful. So let's talk about a little bit around what's happening with McDonald's today and what was the impetus that drove us to need a solution like Citera, which we'll get into about later. The picture you see on your left is our Oak Brook, uh, Illinois location. That is the U.S. Uh, pl it's the Plaza Building. It's the U.S. headquarters. It's not the actual corporate headquarters, but it's a great example of something built, I think, in the late '60s, something like that, um, in Oak Brook, Illinois, which is about uh, from the water. It's about 20 miles from the water. Uh, uh, if you're going into due east of uh, or due west of Chicago, yeah. And what you see on the right is our new building being built right now. In fact, we're supposed to move into that building in. May, um, April or May, depending on who you listen to, into this new building, which happens to be in the city of Chicago, right in a, I wouldn't call it an edgy area, but a very hip area of Chicago. Uh, nice restaurants up and down the street. It's gonna change the vibe around who works there. The, the, it's gonna change a lot of people that, that have to commute to this particular office building. All of this is, is when, we, when we had this opportunity to move this, which means <clears throat> somebody gave us the money, right? When you're gonna move somewhere, you get money. So we and IT people think, well, we gotta do something with it. We gotta create solutions that, support our customers, we've got to be thinking about mobility, we've got to be thinking about work from home, we've got to be thinking about all those sorts of things for the existing use case. The existing use case is, in that building, slightly less old, if you want to say that, less, slightly younger than the building is a file server that has files on it that people are storing stuff on, you know, it's an S drive, I think it is, right? And people are using it for everything and it grows overnight. It's, a, it's an actual box, you know, I think it's, you know, we've got some disk arrays or something like that today. But anyway, it's just file service sitting there. And so people have grown to use it. It's got like a weed. You've got to entrench with how they want to use that box and the use cases. Um, I won't divulge too much about it, but let's just say in IT, we continually get surprised by that critical process that has to be run on your personal shared drive. And so we get surprised by that. See, there's a kind of use case and stuff. Going to the new building, my first thought when I went into it was, and I challenged the team and pushed them pretty hard, is I don't want nothing physical in my office. Nothing, 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 nothing. I want it all in the cloud, you know, go, don't, don't do that. We didn't, that's not the solution we ended up with. We've got a hybrid solution through, uh, again, working with CTR and others around what's the right fit for us, and I'll get into why that is in a minute. But um, largely, it's a matter of, um, again, thinking about how, how I want to go from somebody logs onto a machine, maps an S drive, goes to S drive, gets their files, um, to doing things like doing it with mobility on your phone, on a tablet, accessing the world anywhere, data encrypted in flight and at rest, et cetera, et cetera, right? So we can we make the CISO happy, the CIO happy, and the man I work for, the CTO happy. So let's talk about it. So some of the key challenges we just mentioned, right? You have, um, you, you know, I don't know how many, what's happening in your companies, but uh, I have this, uh, it's not like a Moore's Law, it's just an observation that I said data will, will consume whatever space you give it. So whatever, it's a bit like your house, right? You buy a new house, a bigger house, you gotta make, you buy more stuff. So if you provide data access to somebody, they'll just consume whatever's out there. There's no end to this. I don't know if any of you have solved the problem, but on-prem solving that problem is extremely difficult. It's extremely difficult for me to guess how much infrastructure you have to buy. Uh, we're, a, we're a chargeback organization, so all of our cu customers pay, pay by the usage for that stuff. So they think, you know what? You gave me a buy the drink, I'm drinking them all. Right? How do I govern that? You know, that sort of stuff it gets to be interesting. So you start thinking about cloud solutions or why I wanted to do that. If you look at uh, the performance piece of this, again, we have people that have written elaborate access databases and S, you know, SQL stuff, um, that uh, Excel things that are sitting out on the rest drive, right, that need to get access to and run and they get upset if it doesn't run within minutes. Uh, you think about loss of user productivity you know, around that, that particular solution when it's not available. Remember, it's, a, it's an endpoint, single point of failure, 
disk you know, file server sitting in our corporate office somewhere. And of course, you have to maintain security for that. There are, I'm, I'm sure some of you, like us, have people that work for you called lawyers, and they get upset if they think about data that either comes into the building that shouldn't be here, that's their worst fear, or data that leaves or is in the hands of the wrong person, right? So they care about the zip code that data lives in. So when you go talk to your lawyers about zip codes in cloud, they get a little weird, right? You have to get to boil it down for them, make it kind of simple. No offense to lawyers in the room, but you get what I mean, right? The challenges you have with that. So how do you solve that problem? So <clears throat> with their opportunities around leveraging cloud economics, uh, most of you are fairly aware, you know, S, whether you're talking uh, an S3 or blob or whatever out there in the world, Google uh, storage is a race to the bottom with, with, with respect to expense, and we want to take advantage of that. Um, if you think about if you think about the way we want to we want to help people collaborate, we want to go from this mindset of I just happen to have this extra hard drive mapped on my machine out there that's got this unlimited amount of data associated to it. To how do I make that more collaborative? How do I how do I make sure that the same data doesn't show up 57 times in one place or one server system because everybody's got a myopic view to that that particular data? If you think about speed, and this gets into our solution. Um, uh, what we want to be able to do is get as much data as we can off-prem for all those reasons like security and reliability, um, recoverability, that sort of stuff. But at the same time, offer that person who's written that exquisite, exquisite Excel statement, right, <laughs> to be able to run, you know, on their uh, within within the building and get to get their results quickly back to their their device they're used to. As well as if you think about the security piece of this, right, we want to make sure that we're talking about cloud. We're not talking about, you know public cloud, put on your credit card, buy whatever you want to buy, right? We're talking about McDonald's, uh, a lot of you in your companies, you have, a, you have your own VPC, your own cloud instances, and you want that to function really as an extension of your data center from this perspective of security and access, right? You don't want to have bespoke one-off solutions. You want to make sure that your solution that you use ties into all of your current security and met methodology you have, our back controls, the role-based access controls, et cetera that you want to have, you want to make sure that all of that works for you, so then you can turn this thing on, call it reliable, call it a day. So here's the architecture. Um, the no secret piece, this is what we built. Um, you see the little person down on the bottom left, and you notice this thing called S-Drive. So before I get into some of how this technology is and what it's for, today the user is S-Drive. Remember what I said about the no training piece around what we want to do? It's not that we won't do any training or any heads up, but the idea is this. We're going to swap out all of the technology in the background. We're going to move a lot of data out to the cloud. We're going to provide all these new capabilities. But that user, when they come in the next day and they need to access their data, they're going to do it the exact same way they did it the day before. Their machine is going to map an S drive. It just so happens S is going to be somewhere else. It's not going to be in the building. right? Or there'll be a redirector. We'll talk about the, 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 the edge file. There'll be a redirector outside the building. So we have a VX rail system that we built to put VMs on. On that VM is where the Cetera edge filer runs. It does all the directing of the traffic. We'll get into a little bit more of that later when Jim comes up. Um, but the, the point is the user experience I'm not forcing you to learn anything today. You just come in today, you don't even know what happened, right? We've replaced the technology, you don't know. Another, another benefit is I don't have to buy millions of dollars worth of infrastructure. I don't have to go buy millions of dollars worth of licensing. I start with just what I need. From there, we can scale up to uh, our, 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 our future needs, which you know, could be, uh, we're talking about that two million person ecosystem. I don't think we'll get quite there. But, but my point is what works for one works for all in this particular given situation. And the experience stays the same. With that, you think about, uh, I get one platform. I don't have to have multiple platforms with how I manage this thing. Um, it ties into my existing uh, security setup, so all of the rights, the flow downs, that if you get access rights to your, your shared drives and things like that, all of that stuff stays the same. I don't have to rewrite it. I don't have to go create a new uh, bespoke system. All that stuff works. You'll see the things like the stateless local cache. That you, you, uh, most of you are aware of that. It's going to be, that's mostly for speed and performance, right, the way we do that. Um, and again, the seamless migration means I don't have to, if a user with the role in our Active Directory, all of the rights they have still apply to the S drive, even though the S drive is now completely somewhere else. That for me we made it simplistic, and it makes one of the reasons why we could go with an option like Cetera um, to begin, at least at the corporate offices, before we scale out. Right? Again, less less a bit less need to change, less disruption for our for our particular customer. Oh yeah, I'm loving it. This is but so if you think about it, on this one slide is the reason why I'm loving it. Right? I'm not. I remember back in the days, I'm not impacting my customer. I'm not making huge investments to get this thing off the ground. If for whatever reason uh, this needs to change in the future, there's flexibility and agility to do so. 
So if you think about it, one of the things that we're adding though, but versus putting all that infrastructure, that infrastructure in, making sure that the user's S drive still work with all the security, is this idea that you now can travel around the world using your mobile phone or tablet or your PC and get access to that exact same file. In other words, S drive works for you everywhere you are. And I verified this morning it works behind the Great Firewall of China. I asked him three times <laughs> to make sure that works. Um, we know it works. You know, most of us travel over there, and there's interesting things you can do and not do, as you guys know. But we want to make sure that in-flight encryption works, right? Uh, there's some countries that like to de-encrypt everything as it comes in. You guys are aware of that. We want to make sure it works uh, in, in countries around the world. Again, if you're operating in 120 countries, uh, sets of languages, making things complicated on how to do it is, is, uh, is a non-starter for us. So uh, the other piece of that is if you think about the portal of managing uh, all this data, um, one of the things that we'll, we'll start to be able to do with, with Cetera technology and not with our, our old mapping your S drive is start to understand how, how our customers are using the data, how they access it, where does it go, what are they doing with it, how many times a day, what do the, the, uh, the, the access requests look like? So that we begin to put some analytics around managing how much data we have to have, managing what the, what the performance is to users, measuring that. Today it's just somebody calls a help desk and says our stuff is slow. We have no, no, reason, no known reason why, we just go guesstimate it. Anyway, with this, this is a new, new technology that comes with it, a new capability to go mobile, and all I did was tell somebody that tomorrow you come in and map your S drive the same way you do today, and offer them a, an offer them a mobile portal to get to. So what's next? Uh, if you think about uh, what we're doing specifically with McDonald's and the reasons why we want to do this, uh, you can see them listed out there on your left. Uh, all of the right reasons you go off and do things. When people ask us for something at McDonald's, we're you know I don't know about you, but um, our business is uh, we care about the cost of things a great deal. Uh, a lot of pressure on us uh, to um, uh, to do things at the lowest cost we can. So there's an ROI investment that has to be measured. Most of the time, our ROI, I'll tell you, is um, again a little insider secret. Maybe the same for you is. We do ROIs are largely based on cost, largely based on some type of return, and intangibles often get forgotten. So that ability for users now to run things mobile is something that we didn't even consider as part of the business case because I don't have a tangible way to measure it just yet. But, but, but it's there, right? So uh, what's the focus on? Obviously, if, if, I don't, if I no longer have to worry about maintaining and managing an, uh, a file or device in my building, I have to worry about power to it, UPS, disruptors, paying somebody to manage that thing, somebody go down and dust off the disk drives and put a tape in it every, every once in a while, all that stuff goes away. Uh, for me, that means that everybody involved in doing that or the resources involved in doing that now focus on what we want to do, which is getting back to what I said earlier, being relevant to a restaurant. So what's the roadmap? A little recap, we talked about it, right? Know your business, culture, and appetite for modernization. If you don't have an appetite for modernization, I think I've heard this in other Gartner presentations, don't. There's only so much you can force on people, right? Which again is, if you don't have an appetite, you're mapping your S drive, you don't even know <laughs> that, I've, that I've modernized you. Um, the relevant infrastructure use cases, when you go to put in something like Cetera, understand what it is, understand what your relevant use cases are. And this is basic to understanding how to build, uh, build out a good ROI or build out a good use case, right? Understand what you need. You don't need to tackle every use case. Uh, we have a number of them. We use uh, other products to move large files around that, are, that we need to move for like dig uh, digital media, think about commercials, things like that. And we have another solution in-house today that we're going to be taking out of that solution, which is cumbersome, uh, expensive, um, it, do, it, it ticks the box in terms of uh, things being auditable and, and, and uh, encrypted and things like that, but not well received by our users. Um, what, what we want is to go to more consumable uh, product, which is what Cetera does for us, right? So understand that use case, pull, how that pulls in, and all the relevant ones. There's many more that are out there, but we stick to the ones that we know are going to have the high value, run our POC that way. Uh, talk to Gartner. There's a few there's a plug. Um, uh, if you look at Gartner, obviously you'll see Cetera top right quadrant uh, uh, for their industry. But we talk to them a great deal on how other companies are solving this problem. How do they get around doing these things? What actually works out there in the world? And the reason we talk to Gartner gets back to understanding your use cases and failing fast, right? I want to fail with you in a conversation before I have to fail over an SOW and then fail over a contract and then fail over you know, penalties, right? I'd rather fail at that conversation level if I can. Um, data security aspects, obviously this is a no-brainer, most of you are aware of this, you know, what kind of, do you need encryption in flight, do you need, you know, what levels of things you need to, that you need to put around your data, do you need data governance, you know, what, what are the things about your data that you, need, that you need or your company wants to know about it. Again, one of the unique things about McDonald's is, there's a lot we don't want to know. Believe it or not, corporate McDonald's does not want to know about everything that's happening 
right, within a McDonald's restaurant everywhere around the world. There are reasons for that, right? So there's some data we have to put governance on around what data we're ingesting, things like that. The in-house POC. Uh, this, uh, this really made it for us, right? So we could talk about it again. We want to fail fast somewhere. We work with CTERA, we work with others, we work with uh, uh, EMC. We brought in equipment. We actually ran this stuff uh, in, our, in our own locations or in our own, in our own uh, offices to make sure it does what it in fact it says it's supposed to do. And then uh, all with the mantra of simplifying, converging our infrastructure. I want less stuff. You know, I want less disk, I want less power cords running into things. I want less stuff to have to manage. I just want to be able to access it and just be there. So with that, I'll bring Jim up from Sutera to talk about a few things and don't go away. I think there's a nice giveaway in about a second or two, um, but I'll take questions from you. A professor of mine said once that it takes uh, the average college student 36 <coughs> seconds to generate a question to a professor so they won't look stupid, and it takes a professor 19 seconds to wait on you. So, <laughs> so if you think of something after I'm up here, you're like, oh, we have a question over here. So the, the, how many, the question is how many users are in scope right now? We're limiting it to corporate, so say four to 6,000. Do you have a terabyte cost? I'm sorry? Terabyte cost reduction, the cost per terabyte. So the unit of cost was terabyte. So what I'll do is I'll let Sotero talk about how they monetize that, if, if, if that's okay. Um, uh, I like to think we get a sweet deal because we're McDonald's, but uh, I'll let them talk <laughs> about, about how they want to do that. Yes? Have you had any latency challenges with the S-Drive access? Yes, um, because of some of the legacy, uh, I'm sorry, the question was, do you have any uh, latency issues uh, if you don't have the local caching? So in my original statement, when I came to the room and I challenged the people in the room, I said, I want no infrastructure here. I mean, I was just adamant about it. Um, as stubborn as I am, somebody beat it into my head and said, listen, the people over there in digital and the people over there in finance, right, who have these little queries that we talked about, are freaking out if they don't have the, they don't have a response time of whatever they need. And so we said, fine, we're going to go with the, uh, the local cache solution. So that's the thing that makes it fast, if you will, that the, the local cache device, which the Jim can get into on the way that works. So again, from a user perspective, there is there's um, only a performance increase, if you will, because and let's, let's, I don't want to steal stuff from Citera, but if you just go from an old to a new machine, stuff gets faster, right? But then if you put in their technology, how they do caching, another thing that's important is, you know, we, we talked to legal on the use case there where they said, wait a minute, wait a minute, this data right here needs to stay in this zip code. So with the caching device, we can say, we can tag data and say, you go nowhere, you stay. Right? But then if you load it up into memory cache, it's, it's much faster, and it does this whole algorithm. Jim will talk about how that works, and go to the booth about how the whole caching scheme works. Yes, sir? All of these plays, would you security breach or any ransomware issue? I'm sorry, it was really hard to hear you back there. So, one, one more time? Have you experienced any security breach, any ransomware issue? Uh, no, they, so the question was, do we experience any security breach issues? So uh, let me be uh, candid with you. We are rolling this out, so we have. We don't, I don't have it uh, everywhere in the world just yet. I'm just looking at corporate, um, and so the answer is no. But I do want to qualify that with I haven't put it everywhere in the world just yet. You're thinking about how the how the cloud will access. Um, I don't anticipate that. Uh, again, we have one of the requirements for the security was encryption in flight and at rest. So and and the data never. I mean, yes, it goes to the cloud, but it goes to our cloud. It goes to our instance of of Azure. Right, our instance of AW, our instance of where it goes. We still manage those instances, and today we've not had anything, uh, we've not had an issue like that, that I'm aware of. I'm sorry, yes, ma'am, you had a question? Yeah. Right. So the question was, uh, what about time frames in terms of uh, probably everything, right, from the architecture down to the decision to rolling it out? Um, I, there's a person in the audience today who's responsible for rolling some of this out, and they're the reason it's slow. But uh, <laughs> we won't name that person. <laughs> but um, I'm, I'm the architecture guy, right? So for me, nothing's fast enough. Once, once we decide what to do, it should be built in one day, right? But, but fair question. Um, what I'll tell you is this. It, it's, we have been methodical about what we're doing. It's largely tied to that move schedule of the building. And it's got to tie into that, which you can imagine is a, a, a big program in and of itself of how we're rolling things out and how much change we can force or push on customers. We are right now, though, um, doing the data synchronization. We, we intend to have the solution in place without, our, uh, without most of our customers even knowing it by the time they move to uh, downtown next year. And again, it's largely governed by that. I, I will tell you that from, a, from an implementation of technology perspective, 
I mean, it's, it's uh, again, because you can start small, you can have this in relatively quickly. I mean, it's, it's, it's as fast as however your company can do SOWs, get through legal, get something signed, and put something on the floor. I mean, it's, it's, it's as fast as that. Right? I mean, it's not a, now here's what I'll tell you. It's, it's less about buying into the architecture as it is buying into the strategy. If you buy into the strategy, the architecture lines up to it, makes sense, you check all the use case boxes, and off you go. Is that fair? Uh, you know, I'm sorry, what were the? So the question was, is GDPR, the European regulation, I think it's general data protection regulations, something like that? Um, yes. So uh, obviously, you know, we conduct business around the world. We have all kinds of data. And getting into our, um, those experiences I talked about earlier, we now want to know something about customers. Right? So all of that applies to us. It's definitely on the radar. We talked about things like with Sutera, you can mark data to stay put. You can mark data where it needs to go. We can do some analytics around what that data um, how we want to govern that particular data. So it's definitely on our radar, GDPR is. Um, I'm, I'm assuming it's on everybody's radar, right? Um, I think the European Union is interesting with the whole get it done by May, but okay, right? Um, it's, it's something we thought about when we were looking at uh, the use case security for the, this, this, this circuit. So, I'll answer that, um, and again, I think Cetera can talk a little around how they leverage cloud and what kind of solutions they can bring to you. Because we knew things like GDPR and others that we wanted data to live in places we control, then it's not about Cetera front-ending it and we don't know where the data is behind it, right? So we spec it that way. I'm not sure if there's a, they may maybe talk to you around different options for that, but for us, it's put it in our cloud because we govern our cloud. See that 19 seconds. Yes, sir. Uh, how long, how long uh, was the POC, POC? Gosh, how long was the POC? Uh, three months, something like that. And again, that's largely, I'll hear thoughts here on the POC was mostly around getting the right uh, um, end user testing around stuff, like right? getting them to understand if the performance was good and making sure that if the performance wasn't good that particular day, is it the device, is it the network, what happened? So there's some of that you want to be thorough about, right? And again, that's what we talked about earlier. When you set up your POC, give yourself time to do that, right? Make sure the right you get right buy-in from the customer. So we did about three months. Yeah, that question was how long was the POC? Sorry. Sir. No, the question, so the question was, do we experience any file corruption or file uh, locking, like you may like lock out piece with a, with a solution? Um, I'm gonna say no, um, but let me be candid with you, right? Like I said earlier, we are rolling this out, right? I would, I would assume we're not gonna see that. We have, we have load tested it, we've thrown a lot of stuff at it, but nothing, nothing to date. Anybody else? No one's gonna ask me about the next happy minute. Not, what's <laughs> All right, cool. With that, I'm going to let uh, Jim uh, say Great. Right. Thanks, Joel. That was, that was excellent. Are there any questions that Joel or I can uh, answer for you? Yes, sir. Uh, the question is store simple versus the Citera Edge Filer. Uh, store simple typically uh, an organization would use for large uh, backup or archiving jobs. Uh, our our gateways um, uh, will have that capability as well, but they also offer a functionality, a NAS functionality, a collaboration functionality for, for sites. Um, you know, an office in Dallas collaborating on files with, a, with an office um, here in Las Vegas. Um, for, there are cost effectiveness benefits to the Citera gateway as well, um, and we can dive into that deeper if you'd like. Our chief architect is here if you want to come up after the, after the presentation. And, uh, one thing I would add right, to the uh, use case piece that I didn't mention earlier was um, I talked a little about moving digital media around. So we work with a lot of digital media companies right, that move stuff around. So when we, do, when we send out media or we send out certain things like that, we want to have it encrypted of where it goes. We also want to be able to audit where it goes, who got it, how, how they got it, when they got it. Etc. to confirm when they've got certain data that leaves our company. So now we're talking about going from McDonald's to another entity, but still having that, that uh, at least auditability of knowing exactly where it went, who we shared it with, and keeping it encrypted in, in, uh, in flight. So that was another one of the important things that we need to be able to do, especially for the other system I mentioned as part of our use case. Yes, sir. Are 
So um, I, I mentioned earlier, so the question is, are we looking to keep are we looking at edge devices in all locations or uh, only at the corporate sites? I don't want an edge, as much as I, I, I like the technology, I don't want edge devices anywhere I don't have to have them. So in a, in a, unless there's a reason to have it, from an architecture perspective, I will continually push to not have it, right? And that's mostly due to security, it's mostly due to reliability, support costs. I have a couple of guys here that do, do operations, they understand what it means to put footprints. I mean, there's, a, again, 120 countries, everybody has an office, right? Uh, some we support directly, some we don't. Um, but that could get to be a complex world. And even within the US, you're not talking about one building that runs the US. There are offices throughout the US, not to mention restaurants, right, that are out there. So my preference is, no, the strategy is don't do that. Do it where you have to do it. Just, just to add on to that, the, the, the edge filers, um, our platform is, is highly scalable. So uh, if Joel wanted to, he could easily put yeah. you know, one at each McDonald's branch really in the world. It could scale that high. We've got you know, tens of thousands of, uh, of filers um, in branches for a very large uh, customer of ours. So uh, the platform's built to be essentially infinitely scalable. So, and there are no sort of network hiccups when you keep adding gateways uh, or, or CTR edge filers onto that, now, uh, onto that uh, architecture. We've got one right here and then one in the back. Physical and virtual. Uh, the, the question was, uh, are the filers physical only? If they're physical and virtual. Right back there. The question is, how do you scale the physical filers? Uh, well, with it, because they're caching enabled, you can tier whatever data you don't need locally off to Azure or whatever cloud or on-prem data center you're using. Um, so essentially, uh, if you want to have, uh, let's say, 16 terabyte local, all, always at the edge, you can do that and, and scale off infrequently asked data, uh, access data. Oh, right, right here. Yes. In fact, we're pushing. So the question was, do we offer any virtual desktop interface? So we are trying to push, um, especially our, our partners and suppliers, to use uh, BDI right as a way to access our organization and do the things they need to do. And it won't, the image itself won't look much different. So that's, that S drive will still happen, plus all the rest of stuff they want to use. So whether you're looking at a BDI image or you have to have a laptop that you use, um, image the same, looks the same, feels the same, um, other than you know you're in a BDI. Okay? Uh, so we have both depending on the use case, depending on what kind of user you are. Uh, the question, the follow-up question was, is it a persistent image? And so we do both based on the type of worker you are, the role you have. Anything else? Well, thank you, everybody, for coming. Appreciate it. Thank you.